Greetings, my beloved brothers and sisters, in the precious name of Jesus. I truly want to thank you so much today, brethren, for taking this time once again to join me as we dig deep into the mind of God's precious truth. Brethren, we are living in the most solemn time of this earth's history. And I don't know about you, brethren, but things seem kind of biblical out there as we behold the current events that have been transpiring between Israel and Hamas. We need to know today, brethren, what is all this about? How is this going to lead up to the fulfillment of prophecy? Turn with me to the book of Zechariah, my beloved. Zechariah chapter 14 and verse 2. In the book of Zechariah, my dearly beloved, chapter 14 and verse 2, the Bible says, God says, for I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. The city shall be taken, the houses rifled, the women ravished, and half of the city shall go forth into captivity and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Brethren, we need to understand because the people that do not understand shall fall. Hosea chapter 4 and verse 12. Brethren, do we understand what is going on right now between Israel and Hamas? For God says, I'm going to gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, something that has never, ever taken place. Never. Now, you may be thinking about 721 BC, when the Assyrian power came into Jerusalem and took the ten tribes and scattered them into the lands of the Medes. That's not the fulfillment of this, brethren. Brethren, we have to be close reasoners and logical thinkers. God says, for I will gather all nations, all nations against Jerusalem to battle. Do you know what that's really saying, brethren? That's foretelling a third world war. Brothers and sisters, the next event that is about to transpire, according to the more sure word of prophecy, is the continuation of Second World War or Third World War. That's right, brethren. The greatest of all wars is about to be fought about the Holy Land. And we need to be ready, brethren. We need to be ready whenever a crisis is about to, to take place. God's people must be shut in. God's people must be wrapped up in the righteousness of Jesus. We need to be sealed, my beloved. Shut in, just like Noah was shut in the ark before the impending doom, the impending crisis came upon the earth. See, Noah prepared, brethren. Noah prepared for the crisis. And God shut him in. I mean, do you even know which day God shut Noah in the ark? Brethren, common sense tells you. Since Noah prepared, God prepared Noah. God said to Noah, come thou and all thy house into the ark. For thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. God prepared Noah and all the animals. The clean animals by seven and the unclean by two. And Noah was shut in the ark. You see, you see, brethren, God is a God of order. Since God prepared Noah to be shut in the ark, it was on preparation Friday that Noah was actually shut in the ark. In other words, just like Jesus was in the tomb just before the Sabbath, as the Sabbath drew on, so likewise, brethren, Noah was shut in the ark just before the Sabbath was, was ushered in. Oh, glory, hallelujah, brethren. And I wish I could tell you more about that, brethren, but brethren, we need to be ready. 
the final events will be rapid ones. They're going to happen in quick succession. Therefore, the final events in our own life that concerns our soul salvation, our prayer life, our sanctification must be quickened. Our relationship with Jesus in relation to the study of God's word, it must all be quickened, brethren. What it has taken others years to learn, we're going to have to learn in a matter of months. Time is almost over, brethren. And Zechariah 14 to this prophecy, brethren, has never ever yet met its fulfillment. We've talked about Assyria coming in in 721 BC and taking the 10 tribes, only the 10 tribes. We speak about Babylon besieging Jerusalem around the year 606 BC. That was not the fulfillment of this prophecy, brethren. Look at it, brethren. God says, for I will gather all nations, all nations against Jerusalem to battle. The city shall be taken, the houses rifled, and the women ravished or raped. And half of the city in Jerusalem shall go forth into captivity. Now, what does that really mean, brethren? And the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. See, the residue of the people in the land of Israel, the Bible says, shall not be cut off from the city. This really implies that God, the God of love, the God of mercy, although there are people who are not following the full blaze of light, yet they are living up to the light that is shining right now in their pathway. And God sees them as righteous. Israelites and even Muslims or Arabs that are in the land. God says the residue of my people shall not be cut off from the city. This really goes to show that the only people that will be left in relation to the residue will be the people that will be following the God of Moses. Just like Israel anciently followed the rock. The pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. Jesus was in the cloud. As the Lord led them through the wilderness. And you see, brethren, inspiration speaks about two great banners in these last days. The bloodstained banner of Prince Emmanuel and the banner that bears the inscription of the world and worldliness. Inspiration says, I saw. So many leaving the bloodstained banner of Prince Emmanuel and joining the ranks of the world. How sad, brethren. How sad. And that's why inspiration says, brethren, in Testaments, volume 5, page 217, inspiration says, the church has turned back from following Christ, her leader, and is steadily retreating towards Egypt. The world! You see, brethren, in these last days, many are going to leave our ranks. How sad, brethren. After walking with the Lord for so many years. You see, we cannot take it for granted that just because we have been walking in the narrow path for so many years, we cannot for one minute take it for granted, brethren, that we're always going to be on that narrow path until the end. Jesus said, it's only he that endures unto the end that shall be saved. Unless we watch, unless we pray, unless we keep so close to the Lord, Satan is going to take advantage of our cultivated and hereditary traits of character. Oh, brothers, brothers and sisters. So, brethren, this prophecy in Zechariah 14.2 never even met its fulfillment in AD 70. Oh no. When the Romans came in and destroyed Jerusalem. Oh no, brethren. 
Something greater is coming upon the earth. And the greatest of all wars is about to be fought about the Holy Land. Third world war, brethren, what we are seeing right now, brethren, before our very eyes, we have been talking about it. We have been mentioning it. I have mentioned it. When the war between Russia and Ukraine took place, I will say, brethren, that this could be the war that will lead up to the fulfillment of prophecy. Zechariah 14.2. See, brethren, inspiration says... Each of the ancient prophets spoke less for their own time than for ours, so that their prophesying is in force for us. Do we understand what that really means, brethren? Inspiration says each of the ancient prophets spoke less for their own time than for ours, so that their prophesying is in force for us. Zechariah was one of the ancient prophets. He spoke for our time. The end time, brethren. Third world war, brethren. What we are seeing between Israel and Hamas right now, brethren, it appears that this is the beginning of the fulfillment of prophecy. That's going to lead up to the greatest of all wars that will be fought about the Holy Land. See, brethren, we can see Iran and other nations around Jerusalem Naturally, they're going to take their sides with Hamas. We know already that America, the United States of America, is fully on the side of Israel. But you see, brethren, if Russia and North Korea and some of the other Eastern nations join in this war, that's going to automatically fulfill this prophecy, brethren, in Zechariah 14.2. Why? Because America and the Western Bloc will be fully engaged. And the two great hostile blocks that have evolved since Second World War, they're going to come into mortal combat. And this is what's, what the war is going to be all about, brethren. The nations will confederate. America is going to confederate with her allies, the Western Bloc, to protect her way of life and also to protect herself against the Eastern nations. They see the Eastern nations as a threat. And so they should. Oh, brothers and sisters. But what special bearing is this Third World War going to have, brethren? Because, brethren, we have spoken about First World War, which according to Matthew 24 was the beginning of sorrows, but then came Second World War. But my brothers and sisters, Third World War, the greatest of all wars, is about to be fought about the Holy Land. And we need to understand, brethren, what is happening. How is this going to be for, going to fulfill prophecy? What special bearing will it have on us? Let's go to the book of Isaiah, brethren. Isaiah chapter 8, in the book of Isaiah, my dearly beloved, chapter 8. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 8, and verse 9, the Bible says, Associate yourselves, O ye people, and ye shall be broken in pieces. And give ear, O ye far off countries, gird yourselves, and ye shall be broken in pieces. Gird yourselves, and ye shall be broken in pieces. So the Bible is clear, brethren. It's clear to the upright in heart. You see, in the book of Daniel, chapter 12 and verse 10, the Bible says, Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. See, the wicked shall do wickedly and that's why they don't understand you see unless we clear our lives from all idolatry unless we allow jesus to come in and fill the vacuum behold he says i stand at the door and knock are we going to let him in brethren or are we going to be running to the hills and to the mountains and crying fooling us and hide us 
from the face of him that is coming in all his glory. Brothers and sisters, are we prepared for the crisis? Furthermore, brethren, when you understand that prophecy, run into the mountains. If you take a look at Revelation chapter 6, this prophecy will meet its fulfillment in the sixth seal. Think about that for, the mo for a moment, brethren. The sixth seal. And then you have the last seal in Revelation chapter 8 and verse 1. And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. Brethren, I haven't got time to go into all this right now. But please consider this. Revelation chapter 6, it speaks about the heavens rolling back like a scroll. And every mountain being moved out of its place. And we have commonly understood that as the second coming of Christ. But now, Revelation chapter 8 and verse 1. The half an hour silence. When the seventh seal was opened, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. Now, is that the second coming of Christ also? How many second comings do we have? Think about that, brethren. Is Jesus going to come in the sixth seal and also in the seventh seal? Brethren, think about that for a moment. But for more information on that, brethren, see, we need to understand, beloved. We need to understand what is happening. The prophecy, the truth is going to become deeper and deeper until the time will come when the wicked will not understand. And the place and the point where the wicked first lost out was when they met their idol and they refused to turn away from him, to tear away from him. Oh, brothers and sisters, we are living in solemn times. Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 9. Associate yourselves, all ye your people, and ye shall be broken in pieces. So here we see the first association. Gird yourselves. And ye shall be broken in pieces. Here we see the second association. Where the nations will be girding themselves. Girding themselves for what? And then it says. Gird yourselves the third time. And ye shall be broken in pieces. Brothers and sisters. After the first world war. The league of nations was formed. After the second world war. The united nations was formed. But here we see another association, another confederacy. Here we see another girding themselves for war, which is really implying that there is to be another war. After Second World War, there is to be another war. It says, gird yourselves and ye shall be broken in pieces. Gird yourselves for what? The nations right now, brethren, are girding themselves for Third World War. Brothers and sisters. And the next event that is to transpire according to the more sure word of prophecy is not the reassertion, the reassertion of the Roman power. Oh no, brethren. It's not the mark of the beast. It's not the Sunday law. I have spoken about this time and time again, brethren. Those who are next looking for the reassertion of the Roman power, those who are next looking, looking for the mark of the beast, this next event, the war, is going to be a snare and a trap. Look at verse 10, Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 10. Verse 10, the Bible says, Take counsel together and it shall come to naught. Speak the word and it shall not stand, for God is, is with us. So here we see, brethren, that at this time when the war takes place, God's people take a strong and independent stand against this worldly alliance. See, brothers and sisters, when you look at Isaiah chapter 7, at the very beginning of that chapter, there was a time anciently when the ten tribes of Israel confederated with Syria to go up to Jerusalem to make war with their own brethren. But God did not sponsor that. God did not sponsor that, my dearly beloved. You see, when, whenever the church confederates 
with the world to make war against their own brothers and sisters. God does not sponsor that. God does not sponsor those kind of things. And that's why, brethren, we need to know that which was is that which shall be. And there's nothing new under the sun. There's nothing new. History is about to repeat itself. Oh, brothers and sisters. Look up verse 11. Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 11. For the Lord spake thus to me with a strong hand that and instructed me that I should not walk in the way of this people. See, God does not leave his people in darkness. If we want to know, brethren, our minds, our pathway, we be, will be illuminated. God says, thy, thy word is a lamp unto thy feet and a light unto thy path. The entrance of thy word giveth light. Brothers and sisters, we cannot be like the foolish virgins. The time will come when the foolish virgins will trim their lamps. Oh, brothers and sisters, what does that really mean? The lamp is the Bible. The lamp is the word of God. The foolish virgins, the time will come when they will trim their lamps. They're going to trim their lamps, meaning they're going to look at their, their doctrines as they have formerly believed the word according to current events that will be transpiring uh, around the globe. And when they see that what is happening on planet Earth is not according to their former beliefs, they're going to become somewhat confused and they're going to run to the wise ones and they're going to say, give us of your oil. Now, do you honestly believe, brethren, that when the foolish virgins go to the wise ones and say, give us of your oil, do you believe that they went to the wise ones and said, give us of your Holy Spirit? No, brethren. See, Jesus referred to the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, as the Spirit of truth. Jesus says, when he, the Spirit of truth, will come, he will take of mine, who is the truth, and shall reveal it unto you. You see, the Holy Spirit takes of Christ who is the truth and reveals it unto us. You see, brethren, are we keeping pace with the divinely revealed truth? God has given us meat right now, meat in due season. You see, our former truth will not suffice. We must be keeping pace with the truth, brethren. In every age, there is a new development of truth, a message applicable to the people of that generation. The old truths are all essential. Please do not misunderstand me. New truth is not independent of the old, but an unfolding of it. But it's only he or she that keeps pace with the new truth that will be safe. There will be no other place of safety to, to turn to, brethren. The counterfeits of Satan in these last days will resemble the genuine so closely that the only way that we're going to be able to detect Satan's invisible webs is through the testimony of the scriptures. Peter says we have also a more sure word of prophecy. And we need to understand that, brethren. Do not for a moment think that the prophecies, God has given us so much prophecy in scripture. And brethren, if, I, if I'm going to be honest, Go on to Cyan Crow, we must. Go on to Jimmy Kakuri, meet in due season. Brethren, there are prophecies in the scriptures that even we as Seventh-day Adventists have not understood, which really should be a wake-up call to us. That's why, brethren, God says, blow ye the trumpet in Zion, sound the alarm in my holy mountain. Blow the trumpet. What is the trumpet? Isaiah 58 and verse 1. Cry aloud and spare not. Lift up thy voice like a trumpet and show my people their transgressions and the house of Jacob their sins. The trumpet is the message. There's a message to be given to Zion. Zion is God's church. Zion is God's people. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, not Babylon. Blow the trumpet in Zion. There is a message for the church. Isaiah 51 and verse 16. And I've put my words in thy mouth. Oh, glory, hallelujah. The words that we are speaking are not our own, our own words, oh brothers and sisters. And I have put my words in thy mouth, and I have covered thee in the shadow of my hand, that I may plant the heavens and lay the foundations of the earth, and say unto Zion, 
thou art my people. Zion is God's people, the church. There's a message for the church. In the great antitypical day of atonement, there is a message of present truth. The message is the message of the judgment for the living that seals the 144,000 just before the crisis. See, brethren, don't leave it too long. The antediluvians waited for the crisis to come. They waited for the rain to come. The storm to come. It was too late. The door was shut. Probation will close for the Seventh-day Adventist church just a little bit after they become aroused. They become aroused. They try to make a dash to obtain the extra oil, the additional message of truth. But by the time they went to buy and came back, the saddest of all words were spoken. I know you not. Oh, brothers and sisters, how can we be walking with Jesus? Professing. And that's why they're called virgins, because they profess. But a mere profession is not going to save us. Oh, no, brethren. Jesus, 2,000 years ago, said, Say ye not that you are Abraham's children. Do not think that just because you are a Seventh-day Adventist, you are somehow going to make it into God's kingdom. Oh, brothers and sisters, unless we allow Jesus to fully take control of our lives, unless we make a full and complete surrender of all our sins and habits, that which we do not overcome will finally overcome us. Oh, beloved, do we want to hear the words, leave him alone? Leave her alone! For he and she is joined unto their idols. Oh, brothers and sisters, you know, when I think about Judas, Jesus could not give him up. Jesus served Judas first in the upper room. See, Judas wanted to be first, then Jesus served him first. What love is that? accepted his case of betrayal and and served him first how can i give him up the heart of jesus the burden that jesus had for judas so great and while he was washing the feet of judas the the love of god the love of christ was felt by Judas and for a moment he felt like putting away his sin of betrayal but brethren you see you cannot dilly dally with sin do not think that you can just play with sin and that you are in control of it and that when you decide you can just put away your sin it doesn't work that way brethren you see Satan Satan took control of Judas Judas gave himself over to to Satan and when Judas left the upper room the Bible says it was night but the night out there could not be compared to the darkness and night that enveloped his soul brethren don't play about with sin do not and that's why it's time to investigate it's time to examine ourselves to see whether we are in the faith not a professional faith no are we in the faith are we living up to all the light and truth that is shining our pathway? And brethren, do not think that to neglect, you're not going to be held accountable. To neglect divinely revealed truth. If you neglect the opportunity of availing yourself of the extra oil, you will be held accountable. To neglect is to reject and you will be judged for that. Jesus says, this is the condemnation that light has come. And men prefer darkness. Light has come, brethren. The angel of Revelation chapter 7 and verse 2. John says, I saw another angel ascending from the east. Notice, brethren. Again, we must be close reasoners and logical thinkers. Revelation 7, 2. John says, I saw another angel ascending from the east. An angel is a message. Like the three angels' messages. Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. Babylon the great is fallen is fallen. If any man worships the beast of his image, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. Oh, brothers and sisters, three angels in Revelation 14, 
from verse 6 on down, three messages. But this angel, this message in Revelation 7, 2 was not flying in the midst of heaven like the three angels messages. It was ascending from the east. What naturally ascends from the east? The sun. Showing that this angel message in Revelation 7, 2, that, that seals the 144,000. Because in verse 4, the Bible says, And I heard the number of them that were sealed. Sealed with what? Sealed with the angel of Revelation 7, 2. And I heard the number of them that were sealed. And there were sealed 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. We are modern day Israel, brethren. Testament volume 9, 164, inspiration says, In order to be purified and to remain pure. That's beautiful. Because it's not, it's not only being purified and being cleansed, it's remaining pure and cleansed. In order to be purified and to remain pure, Seventh-day Adventists must have the Holy Spirit in their hearts and in their homes. The Lord has given me light, inspiration says. That when the Israel of today, that's the Seventh-day Adventist people, that when the Israel of today humble themselves before him and cleanse the soul temple from all defilement, he will hear their prayers in behalf of the sick and will bless in the use of his remedies for disease. Oh, brothers and sisters, we are the Israel of today. Just like God gave his oracles to ancient Israel, the sanctuary service in connection with the sanctuary, God has given us today as Seventh-day Adventists, the three angels' message in addition to the fourth angel. The fourth angel's message is Revelation 7-2. Ascending from the east. That seals the 144,000. Not for resurrection but for translation. See this message is the message that seals the living. And that's why in Isaiah chapter 4 and verse 3. Isaiah says. It's only he that is left in Zion. And he that remains in Jerusalem that shall be called holy. Even everyone that is written among the living in Jerusalem. Written among the living. You see, brethren, it's only the sealed ones. The 144,000. When the judgment begins in the house of God, that will be sealed and written among the living. In the Lamb's Book of Life. The unconverted in the Seventh Adventist Church, their names will be blotted out from the Book of Life. But the 144,000 that accept the extra oil, the additional message, they will be sealed and their names will be retained forever among the living in the Lamb's Book of Life. Brothers and sisters, in Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 11, the Bible says, For the Lord spake thus to me with a strong hand and instructed me that I should not walk in the way of this people. You see, brethren, when the soon coming war happens and takes place we must not go along with it why because it's going to be a snare and a trap look up verse 12 what has God told us right now what is God instructing us to say then when this confederacy takes place and when this gigantic war third world war takes place what is God telling us to actually say look at it brethren look up verse 12 say ye not a confederacy to all them to whom this people shall say a confederacy neither fear ye their fear nor be afraid see brethren this soon coming war is going to bring great fear and brethren look at the look at the fear that is taking place right now over there in Israel you know missiles flying hundreds of missiles flying to and fro see Jesus spoke about this time brethren when he said in the Gospels that the time will come when men's hearts shall be failing them for fear, for looking after those things that are coming upon the earth. You see, Jerusalem is to be trodden down of the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Luke chapter 21 and verse 24. See, brethren, the time of the Gentiles has almost met its complete fulfillment. Jerusalem is only to be trodden down of the Gentiles up to a certain time until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Right now the Gentiles are in the land but the time is going to come when according to Zechariah 14 2 God says half of the city shall go forth into captivity 
meaning that God's going to drive out the wicked from the land of Israel. But the righteous will be left in. The residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. So the war, brethren, begins the cleansing. The war begins the cleansing, the first phase of the cleansing of the land. But now according to Zechariah chapter 1, and we're going to go to that, brethren. Because according to Zechariah chapter 1, mention is made of four carpenters. Now naturally, carpenters, they are builders. But according to Zechariah chapter 1, these four carpenters, which also are Gentile nations, count it not strange, brethren. Anciently, after the, the people of Judah, the two tribes, spent 70 years in Babylon, it was Cyrus that made that decree that whosoever was willing could come back to Jerusalem and build the temple. See, brethren, God used a gentile king to help build in the things of God there's nothing new under the sun brethren the four carpenters we're going to see are gentile nations that although the war begins the cleansing of the land the four carpenters if you look at Zechariah chapter 1 they are coming to free the land to cast out the horns of the gentiles which did lift up their horn over the land of Judah to scatter it. So the four carpenters will finally cleanse the land. And brethren, this one, and that's why I'm saying, brethren, this message supersedes all other messages. Why? Because it's the message of present truth. It's the message that seals the 144,000. So the next event is the war. God frees the land. Why does God free the land? Because the, the Bible is clear that in the last days, Micah chapter 4 and verse 1, God says, but in the last days, the time will come when the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the mountains, shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow into it. And many nations shall go and say, come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach it of his ways and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the, the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Wow. For out of Zion shall go forth the law. That's right, brethren. The law hasn't been done away with. Oh no, brethren. Till heaven and earth pass, not one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law until all be fulfilled. Oh, brothers and sisters. Glory, hallelujah. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from where? From Jerusalem. See, after God frees the land, after God cleanses the land, the 144,000 are taken by a miracle back to the land that God gave unto their fathers and they shall possess it. Brother and sisters, the 144,000 stand with the lamb on Mount Zion. Revelation 14, 1. Now, when the Bible says Zion, it refers to God's people. When it says Mount Zion, it refers to location. In other words, the headquarters for the final proclamation of the everlasting gospel in these last days. Oh, brothers and sisters, is Mount Zion. The land that God gave unto our fathers. And it's no coincidence, brethren, that Revelation 14.1 speaks about the 144,000 standing on Mount Zion with the Lamb. Now, I've explained this before. The reason why Christ is referred to as being a Lamb here, while the 144,000 stand with him on Mount Zion, is because he's still bleeding. Remember in Revelation 4 and 5, John saw a Lamb as it had been slain, wounded and bruised and bleeding. See, Christ is making atonement. His blood is still interceding for sinners. 144,000 first fruits, 144,000, Revelation 14, 4, the first fruits of the harvest stand first with the lamb on Mount Zion. But the reason why Christ is referred to as being a lamb is because although probation has now closed for the church, it's still open for the world. And the 144,000, according to Obadiah 121, and saviors shall come up on Mount Zion. Oh, brethren, let me to understand that. This message supersedes all other messages. And saviors shall come up on Mount Zion. We've just seen that in Revelation 14.1. But why saviors? Because as saviors, they're still going to have a work to do in proclaiming the everlasting gospel. To all the world. 
the 144,000 first fruits of the harvest will have the grand privilege once they reach Mount Zion, God's going to pour out the Spirit upon them. He's going to pour out the Holy Spirit upon the 144,000, my dearly beloved. And they're going to go into all the world and proclaim the everlasting gospel. And that's why when you go back to Revelation 14, brethren, when you go to Revelation 14, 144,000, they stand with the Lamb on Mount Zion. Then in verse 6, John says, and I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to all the nations. Who's going to preach the, the everlasting gospel to all the nations? And from where is the everlasting gospel going to be preached? Look at the, the, the Bible verse, brethren. Look at the text in its context. The 144,000 preached the everlasting gospel from Mount Zion. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Brethren, the first dominion, Micah chapter 4 and verse 8, the first dominion shall be given to the daughter of Zion, the kingdom, Micah chapter 4 and verse 8. The first dominion that Adam lost through sin is going to be restored. That's why, right, brethren, God's going to have a people on planet earth that will fully reflect his character and that will be in his land, the land that God gave unto our fathers. Oh, brethren, God's going to bring his people from all nations. He's going to gather them from all nations. Ezekiel 36 and verse 24. God says, I'm going to gather you from all nations and bring you back to the land that I gave unto your fathers. And you, you're going to possess it. The land that I gave unto Jacob. And I'm going to save you out of all of your uncleanness. And I'm going to pour out my Holy Spirit upon you and as you read on brethren in Ezekiel 36 it says this land that was desolate that's what the the nations will be saying this land that was desolate is become like the garden of Eden oh brethren the garden of Eden the first dominion Oh, brethren, that's why I'm saying that this message supersedes all other messages. It stretches your faith to the, to the limit. And that's the nature of the message. It's a message of faith. This is righteousness by faith. My dearly beloved, righteousness, Christ's righteousness by faith, which comes from hearing and hearing the word of God. Oh, my dearly beloved. Isaiah chapter 8, God says, say ye not a confederacy. Don't go along with this war. Fear ye not their fear. You see, at this time, brethren, it's the man with the greatest faith that will fear the least. Great fear is going to be in the land. But the man with the greatest faith will fear the least. This is the time, brethren. This is the time to develop that faith. If we are approaching the time when we're either going to have to confederate or sacrifice our lives, are we developing that faith that will cause us to believe that in those days men shall seek death and death will flee from them? Brethren, death is going to confront us. Just like the three Hebrew boys when they faced the fiery furnace. Just like Daniel when he faced the lion's den. Yeah. Faith must increase. We need ever increase in faith. From faith to faith, brothers and sisters, that's why God has given us this message. So that we can reach the faith that is needed to stand in these last days. The faith that we had yesterday, brethren, is not going to suffice. Jesus gives a measure of faith when you begin the walk of sanctification. But brethren, the faith that we had then is not the faith that we're going to need when this crisis comes upon the earth. Don't, don't, don't go by your feelings, brethren. The righteous, the just, do not live by feeling. Do not do things just because you feel like it. If the word of God says it, do it by faith. Live by faith. 
and not by sight and not by feeling. Look up verse 13, brethren, Isaiah 8, 13. Sanctify the Lord of hosts himself and let him be your fear and let him be your dread. See, at this time, God's people are fully sanctified. And the word sanctified means to be fully, all out for God, set apart, fully consecrated for Jesus. Verse 14. And he shall be for a sanctuary, but for a stone of stumbling and for a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel, for a gin and for a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And many among them shall stumble and fall and be broken and be snared and be taken. This is exactly what I was saying, brother. Those who are next looking for the reassertion of the Roman power, the mark of the beast, this confederacy, this third world war is going to be a snare and a trap. And Zion's going to lose her men in this war. Isaiah chapter 3 and verse 25. Isaiah chapter 3 and verse 25, it says, Thy men shall fall by the sword, and thy mighty in the war. Zion's men are going to fall out in this war, brethren. That's why I'm saying God has instructed us right now that we should say, don't go along with it. Don't go along with it. Because in Second World War, brethren, many Seventh Adventists went along with that war. Brethren, the Sixth Commandment, thou shalt not kill. When we face this crisis and brethren as i said before the war that we are seeing right now brethren between israel and hamas brethren how long do we have how long do we have probation is about to close inspiration has only allotted allotted six thousand years in the book great controversy Page 328, Inspiration says, From the time Adam fell to the cross was 4,000 years. The cross was AD 31. If we add another 2,000 years to AD 31, it takes us right up to 2031. Now, brethren, God has only given us 6,000 years of human probation. It's amazing that God says for every day, a day in God's sight, this is a thousand years and a thousand years as one day it's amazing brethren god has given us six days of creation he's given us six thousand years of human probation the seventh day really represents the millennium the one thousand years where all the righteous will be in heaven that's right brethren I haven't got time to to go into the millennium right now but during the one thousand years the millennium the dead in christ rise first we which are alive and remain caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Meet the Lord in the air to go where? Jesus, I'm coming to prepare, I've gone to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I'm going to come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. Christ comes to take us to heaven. The wicked that will be alive on the earth will be destroyed by the branch of Christ's second coming. In other words, the only people, and I say people, brethren, the only individuals that will be on the earth during the millennium will be Satan and his angels, bound by the angel that comes down in Revelation 20 and verse 1, bound by a great chain of circumstances. Satan suffers very intensely. During the 6,000 years, he's been so busy deceiving and destroying. But during this time, he has no one to tempt. He suffers very intensely. But during the 1,000 years, Satan is bound. But after the 1,000 years, according to Revelation 20 and verse 7, when the 1,000 years have been expired, he is loosed for that little season. And that little season, brethren, go to the flood study. The flood in type and anti-type. In the flood study, it really shows us that the little season is 100 years in length. It's a little season in comparison with the thousands of years of his existence. So during the, during the millennium, brethren, Satan has no one to tempt. All the righteous are in heaven. They live and dwell with Christ, Revelation 20. They dwell with him in heaven for a thousand years. But in Revelation 21, when the new Jerusalem comes down, then the tabernacle of God is with men. Notice the difference. Revelation 20, we live and dwell with Christ for a thousand years. I think that's verse 4. 
But in Revelation chapter 21, when the new Jerusalem comes down after the millennium and Christ eventually makes the earth new, the tabernacle of God is with men. So whereas we, we dwell with him in heaven, don't miss the point, brethren. We dwell with him in heaven during the thousand years. After the thousand years, the tabernacle of God is with men on this earth. Glory, hallelujah, brethren. So, brethren, the tabernacle of God will be with men. And we don't want to miss out on that, brethren. We don't want to be on the earth during the 100 years. Hell on earth. That will be hell on earth. Brethren, to be with the wicked, no Holy Spirit to restrain wickedness. See, brethren, as Joshua said, God says, I've set before thee life and death. Choose life. But Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Are we going to serve the Lord, brethren? Let us not pro procrastinate, brethren. Let us not put off the day of preparation. Let's not dilly-dally with sin, brethren. Because sin, you see, you can't control it. The only individual that dealt with sin was Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. And it's only as we follow his ways, it's only as Christ dwells with it, within us by living faith that we can walk victoriously. So brethren, it's going to be a snare and a trap. Zion's going to lose her men in this war. Beloved, thy men shall fall by the sword and thy mighty in the war. In Testament volume 1, page 270, inspiration says, War lifts its helmet to the brow. Oh God, protect thy people now. Oh, brethren, we need the protection of God. Many I saw inspiration says, we're without shelter in the time of crisis. Why should we wait, brethren? Why should we wait? Are we going to love sin more than righteousness? Jesus died to take away our sins. Therefore, we need to give him what he died for. Galatians chapter 1 and verse 4. He died to save us from our sins. We need to give him what he died for, brethren. Brothers and sisters. The time is short, brethren. God is calling. Will you hear? Will we be converted before it's too late? Soon and very soon, every case will be decided for eternity. Brothers and sisters, this message is solemn. The king of the north, in, Rev in Daniel chapter 11 and verse 45, is about to plant his tabernacles between the seas in the glorious holy mountain. Yet he's going to come to his end and none are going to help him. What does that really mean, brethren? Who is the king of the north? A word to the little flock, brethren, page eight and nine. Inspiration says the same power that is foretold in Daniel 11, 45 is the same power that is foretold in Revelation 13, 11 through to 18. And his number is 666. Oh, beloved, which power is foretold in Revelation 13, 11 through to 18? Great Controversy, page 440, is the United States of America. Inspiration says, unmistakably, it points to the United States of America. So therefore, the power foretold in Daniel 11, 45, is the United States of America, who plants his tabernacles between the seas, meaning the Mediterranean Sea and the Red Sea. But what does that mean, planting his tabernacles? And what is this planting of the tabernacles? What does it really mean, brethren? doesn't say he's going to bring his whole palace there, but he's going to plant his tabernacles, a branch of his palace between the seas, between the two seas, the Mediterranean Sea and the Red Sea, in the glorious holy mountain. What is the glorious holy mountain, brethren, referred to here? And why does the king of the North America at this time want to plant his tabernacles between the seas? You see, brethren, whenever the devil does something, he always wants to make it look attractive. The reason why the king of the north, the United States of America, at this time is choosing to plant his tabernacles between the seas in the glorious holy mountain, which is none other than Mount Sinai, 
is to attach holiness to the Christian's God. He wants to make it look attractive and holy. So what are we seeing here, brethren? The king of the north planting his tabernacles between the seas in the glorious holy mountain is none other than the establishment of the new world order. The setting up of the mark of the beast. Why Mount Sinai? Brethren, what greater place to head this soon coming ecclesiastical world government than Mount Sinai? Where God spoke the law audibly and he wrote the law with his own finger. See, Satan, to attach holiness and sacredness to the Sunday law, he's going to head it from Mount Sinai, where the law was actually given and proclaimed in awful grandeur. Satan is the great deceiver, brethren, and that's why you can't play games with him. He deceives sinless angels. He deceives sinless Eve. Who are we, brethren? Who are we? The only safe path is to follow the more sure word of prophecy and to have Christ, the hope of glory, living in us. Christ in me and you, brethren, the hope of glory. Brothers and sisters, we are living in serious times. Serious times. Because remember, brethren, Daniel 11 is really speaking about wars between the king of the north and the king of the south. In Daniel chapter 11 verse 45 it says yet he shall come to his end and none, none are going to help him. See that is really also including the war, third world war. When the Bible says the king of the North America comes to his end and none shall help him. See it really shows us brethren that we can't see things always on the surface. The truth does not really lie on the surface. It lies deep within the scriptures. And God says, surely I will do nothing, but I will reveal my secrets unto my servants, the prophets. Surely I will do nothing. Comes to his end and none help him. Whenever America goes to war, she has always received help by the Allies. But when she, help, when she loses out in this soon coming war, none are going to help her. America is about to lose out, brethren. She is about to be beaten down to her knees. And I can talk more about that, brethren. But brethren. Is the life that we live in a Christ-centered life? Are we being overcome as daily by the blood of the Lamb? Brethren, Third World War is about to break out. And when this war comes, unless we are sealed, unless we are shut in with Christ and his righteousness, and that's why in Zephaniah chapter 3, actually Zephaniah chapter 2 and verse 3, it says, seek righteousness and seek meekness. It may be that you shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. See, seek righteousness and seek meekness. It may be that you shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. Brothers and sisters, I would want to speak more about this, but time has sufficed to say that we are on the end of all things. Just like when God said the end of all things has come, up, come upon the earth. In the days of Noah, brethren, we are living right at the end of time. Brethren, may God help us. May God quicken us. May God sanctify us. And I know I mentioned the 6,000 years, brethren. And I'm not saying that in 2031, that's going to be the second coming of Christ. I'm not saying that. Because we are going by the Gregorian calendar. But what I am saying, brethren, we are living right on the knife edge. Of eternity may god bless us brethren may god keep us may god quicken us and sanctify us and justify us through his precious word and through his righteousness and through the power of his holy spirit may god bless us brethren until we meet again in jesus precious and glorious and holy name amen